Trust you all had a good Thanksgiving, had plenty to eat. Hope you deer hunters had good success too. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to end uh, the series of messages on 1 Thessalonians. And uh, my goal is to put some Christmas messages together, but also uh, begin to talk about spiritual warfare in the last days. I believe we are in the last days, the, the last last of the last days and uh, we need to be prepared for the battle that uh, sure looks like uh, we are uh, gonna are fighting are gonna be fighting even more so um, in the times ahead scripture has a lot to say about that and we need to be we need to be ready we need to be prepared and um, looking forward to that looking forward to those those messages Titled the message this morning, A Wish and a Prayer, A Wish and a Prayer. First Thessalonians chapter 5, let's begin reading with verse 23. And as I said, we'll finish the chapter. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, you ever watched a couple of young lovebirds on their cell phones trying to hang up? <laughs> I, I, listening is sometimes kind of funny to those conversations. Uh, you know, it goes something like this. You say goodbye first. No, you say goodbye first. Okay, when I count to three, we'll both hang up. One, two, three. Are you still there? <laughs> of course, neither one would hang up, and that process starts all over again. Sometimes when I've heard those conversations, I would like to go over, take the cell phone, and say goodbye and hang up for them. It's amazing that uh, when your children start being interested in the opposite sex and they get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, to get your cell phone bill and look through the minutes and wonder how in the world they could possibly spend that much time on the phone. So you know where I'm coming from to that. Well, this is, this is Paul here. He's writing this letter and it's like he doesn't want to end it. He keeps thinking of things that he wants to pray for these, these believers. And so we could, we could say that this is the inspired goodbye of the Apostle Paul. He's going to write the Thessalonian church another letter, but he probably doesn't know it yet. He loved these people. He was their spiritual father. And he focuses in on one major topic, and that is their sanctification. It really is nothing new. It's been something that he has talked about throughout this letter. He talks about it in, in chapter 3 and verse 13, chapter 4, verse 3, 4, 7, and 8. Six times, six times. He doesn't want to hang up, so to speak, without talking about it one more time. And this blessing of, of uh, verses 23 through 24 is really a wish prayer. It, he indicates that it is both a prayer and a blessing at the same time. You know, if we were standing in the midst, Paul wouldn't have been staring up into heaven with his, with his hands stretched out, saying, Lord, would you sanctify these dear brothers and sisters of mine holy? Would you sanctify them entirely? No, I think Paul would have got right down in their face, grabbed their shoulders, and said, I pray that God would sanctify you wholly. I pray that God would sanctify you completely, that you would be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. It says there in the scripture, and the very peace, the God of peace, sanctify you wholly. Now it's not holy as in H-O-L-Y. It's holy as in W-H-O-L-Y. 
which means complete or entirely. That is all of you. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body, all of you, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. So this is God, this is Paul's wish. This is what he ends his letter for with praying that these dear believers would be wholly sanctified. Sanctification means to be set apart. Really has two aspects to it. It means to be separate from sin, separated from from the world, and then to be set apart for God. There is the the negative and the positive, to be separated from sin and then to be set apart uh, for God. This is the work of God. And in our text, it involves three things. It involves peace, perseverance or protection, and then finally, perfection. So we look at, first of all, peace. You notice that Paul identifies God as the God of peace. In the Jewish way of thinking, it may be related to the Hebrew word that we associate with peace, shalom, which means more than a mere absence of noise or freedom from trouble. It has the idea of wholeness or well-being. It's not a surprise then that, that Paul prays that the God of peace would sanctify them entirely, or in other words, he wishes and prays that God would look well to their well-being in all of these areas, in their soul, in their spirit, and in their body. May each of these areas be blessed by God. He wants a complete surrender and setting apart also in consecration of every dimension of their lives to God. Every dimension, God wants every dimension of us, the physical, the spiritual, the mental, the emotional. You know, Jesus himself similarly uh, called his disciples to what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, that is your spirit, and with all of your soul, that's your, your mind, your will, and emotions. With all your mind and with all your strength, that is, that is your body. God wants our entire selves, not parts of us. He wants us to be wholly consecrated and sanctified to him. The second major word that we're going to look at there is the word perseverance, or perservation, rather. Paul also says that his brothers and sisters in Thessalonica would be preserved blameless or complete in verse 23. And the Greek word there means to watch over to guard and to keep. So God watches over us. He guards us. He keeps us. And in this context, the keeping is connected to the sanctifying. You tie those together. It refers to being protected from uh, the unholy contamination of a sinful world. Though we may be able to stray, he's asking God to, to keep us Keep us from strain by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. That idea of of sealing is a common picture in New Testament times. Important documents were often sealed. It's kind of like today if you were to go to a notary and you had some important papers what would they do? They would take their, their seal and they would press that seal onto that document. I, I remind you that Paul was a lawyer and he's using the word sealed here in a legal way. Now Paul says that when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we are born again, one of the ways that we know that that has happened, we know that we are saved, one of the, one of the proofs, the means of authenticating evidence is that we have this genuine, bona fide, legally sense of belonging to Jesus Christ. It is God placing his seal upon us. Now, the seal that he places upon us is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. When you were born again, when you were saved, you received the Holy Spirit 
into your life. He indwells you. And so we are sealed with this Holy Spirit of promise. So what does that mean? It means, first of all, it means finality. It means the transaction is, is done. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. The work that I needed to do to pay for the sin of mankind, that work is done. It's, it's finished. It also means uh, security. There is security in that. The, the transaction is safe. And the third thing it means is identity. It shows to whom the transaction has been delivered. It stands for authenticity. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul talked about this ceiling in Ephesians and also in Colossians. In both of those cities, Ephesus and Colossae, uh, were known for their lumber. Uh, they, they were logging cities, and they would ship trees and big parcels of wood to other seaports. And the owner would put his seal upon the particular piece of lumber that belonged to him, and it would be, it would be shipped. And when it got to the new, the new port, that seal would be the sign of ownership. This lumber belongs to so-and-so. They own it. They belong to him because his seal has been placed on it. It's also a mark of security. The owner would put his seal on it and then someday come back for that which is his. So here's this lumber that's about to be shipped off. The owner would put the seal, put his seal on it, and then it would be shipped. When it got to the next port, he could go down, he could find which pieces were his because his seal was on it, and he would come and he would claim it then uh, for himself. I, I love this because the same is true of us as God's people. We, we are marked, we are marked people. And someday, someday God is going to come back to get us. I, I love this because Jesus is the one, right, who promised to send the Spirit, right? He said, I gotta go. I, it, it's expedient for you that I go away. But if I go, I will send another comforter. I'll send another just like me. I will send the Holy Spirit. And he followed through on that promise. On the day of Pentecost, uh, that began. Um, and then the seal of the indwelling believer upon the church of Jesus Christ. Now, think about this. If Jesus followed through with his promise to send the Spirit, don't you think he's going to follow through on his promise to come again and get us? I'm as certain that he is coming again to get us as I am that I am sealed with his Spirit now. We are signed and sealed, and one day we will be delivered. Uh, anybody here ever send registered mail? I don't know if that's such a, a big thing uh, anymore, but... Uh, used to send registered mail. Do you know that when you send registered mail, only the sender and the, and the receiver, either the sender or the receiver of that piece of mail could break the seal, could open that registered letter. God is both. God is both the sender of the Holy Spirit and God is the one who also will come and receive us back into himself. God is both. A long time ago, there was something called layaway. <laughs> and you know, around this time of the year especially, we'd, you'd go to the store and you didn't have the money to pay for the gift and so you'd, or the item when you wanted to purchase, so you put it on layaway. And then um, when you put it on layaway, you put, you put a down payment on it. And it was held in the store until you came and paid it off. You, you could, go, if you wanted to, you could go in periodically, and maybe you had to go in periodically and make, make payments on it. But when you paid it off, it belonged to you. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our salvation. Uh, there, there is, there's still a, a future salvation. There's a future redemption of our bodies. But it's like the Lord has put down earnest money. Uh, for our future salvation, and he's, he's put us on layaway. And I know some of these analogies, they break down in, in spots. Uh, but someday the Lord will come and retrieve us and take us to heaven. He will come and he will get us. And his, his promise of that, the seal of that, the down payment of that, is that he said, I would send the Holy Spirit, and he did. 
The Holy Spirit becomes the down payment. Now think about this. Think about this. God's earnest money is God himself. Because God said, Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit, right? Who is God himself? So God himself, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is God's guarantee of our future salvation. It all hinges upon, upon God. We have, we have the pledge here, we have the pledge here that there is more to come. Um, you know, everything that we enjoy about the Holy Spirit is really just a, a foretaste of what is to come. It's only the down payment. There is an incredible lot of things yet to happen. All we have received is the first installment. All we have received is just, is just a sample of what heaven is going to be like. Do you ever uh, get to lick the bowl? <laughs> you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever, mom, grandma, somebody's doing the, the Christmas baking. Can I lick the bowl? You know, can I, can I have the beaters? Can I have the spatula? What are you doing? You're taking a, just a taste, just a foretaste of what is yet to come. That is what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit, what we received of him now, is just a foretaste of what is to come. I'm here to tell you, church, the best is yet to come. The, the Holy Spirit is, is, it's like being allowed into the kitchen to have a, a taste of the feast that is to come. I want you to think right now about the best experience you have ever had with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. The best experience you have ever had with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's just a taste. That's just like licking the bowl. That's just like licking off the spatula or, or um, just having a sampling. We, it's like we have received the first dollar of the many celestial dollars to come. The Holy Spirit is our seal. This is really our, our sanctification here that is being talked about. The Holy Spirit is working daily in our lives uh, to accomplish God's will in making us like Jesus and sanctifying uh, ourselves. So in this, to guard and protect us, To preserve us, God doesn't remove us from this world, but he insulates us from its devastating effects. In uh, John chapter 17 and verse 15, this great intercessory prayer of Jesus is that I do not pray that, pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And so while we are in the world, while we are living here, God is protecting us. He is sanctifying us. The Holy Spirit is ministering in us. The Holy Spirit is ministering through us. Finally, Paul says, uh, we come to a place of perfection. Paul prays that God would receive his brothers and sisters in Christ without blame when Christ comes, when Christ returns. Now, sanctification, there are three main aspects to it. And we're going to get, I know we're going to get a little theological this morning. But it's, it's a great thing to, to, to learn. First of all, there is this positional area of sanctification. God has set us apart as his special possession. Look at your neighbor next to you. That is a special possession of God. You are a special possession of God. And God has set you apart. This happens when, when you are saved. And then there is progressive sanctification. God begins a process of daily working in our lives where we are more and more set apart for him, separated from the world and set apart for him. Sometimes that's called practical sanctification. And then finally, there is perfect sanctification. And this happens when, 
we are glorified when we see Jesus. As 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, th verse 2 says, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Someday, we are going to be like Jesus. Now we know that all things are working together for good to conform us into that image of Jesus Christ. But someday we're going to be like him. And here's the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is to become so much like Jesus right now that when he comes for us, the work of transformation won't be that great. God is working in your life because you are special to him. And he said, I want what's best for you and I want to sanctify you and I have, I have determined that you are going to be like Jesus, that you are going to be made into his image. I've made up my mind that's going to happen in your life. And the things that happen in our life don't happen by accident. They are happening to make us more like Jesus. And someday when he returns, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. But you are his special person, and he has declared, because you are special to me, I am going to make you, I'm going to like, make you like me. And someday I'm going to bring this salvation to a, to completion, and you are going to be glorified in my presence. So the coming of, I said this at the beginning, um, that the book of Thessalonians mentions the second coming of Jesus, the coming of Jesus in every chapter. That's, a, that's the message Paul is trying to get. He says, I'm writing this so that you will live in light of his coming. And that's the way we need to live our lives. We need to live our lives in light of his coming, that he is coming back for me. So what does that mean for me right now? What do I have to do uh, right now? See, when God saves us, we're justified immediately in our spirit. God looks at us just as if we had never sinned at all. He looks at us and he sees the righteousness of Christ. That's an amazing thing. That, that, that is our position. But he, he sanctifies us progressively in our soul. Every day, he's working on us, sanctifying us, making us more like Jesus. And then finally, there is this glorification that takes ultimately in our body. You see, God is not finished with, our, with us yet. Justification is past. Sanctification is present. Glorification is future. In our text, there are two main aspects of, of sanctification. There is the progressive, the daily working out of that, and there is the perfect, that the, someday we will be perfect, we will be mature, we will be complete, we will be in the image of Christ. This is over every area of your life. That's what Paul said, that he might sanctify you through and through, that he might sanctify you spirit, soul, and body. And may you become, may you become and practice what you are already before the Lord, the way you are already seen by the Lord. And so all of this to say that God works on the inside and our job is to the, work with him to change us from the inside out. Now, again, we are encouraged to live in light of that, that coming. Harry Ironside was asked what he would do if he knew the Lord was coming that night. He said, I would have a warm drink and go to bed. He said, I live every day in the light of his coming, so I see no need to change my routine. It's the way we need to live. You know, just picture the jubilation when the trials and the tribulations and the struggles against sin, the suffering, the death, and all of that gives way to the glories of the eternal life in a new heaven that God has created, where only righteousness will dwell. And all of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation will be standing before our Savior with no rebuke, no condemnation, no guilt. Paul says blameless. And Jude gave us in his benediction the same glorious thought. He said, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with rejoicing. 
To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God is faithful. God is faithful. He's faithful in a number of areas. Uh, he is faithful in his calling. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. God is faithful in our, to complete our salvation. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is, what's that word? Faithful. God is faithful, and by him you were called to the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know that God is faithful to you when you are tempted? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has taken you except what is common to man, but God is what? faithful and he will not permit you to be tempted above what you may can endure but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it god is faithful to keep his promises first second corinthians 1 18 as surely as god is what faithful our word to you has not been yes and no god is faithful to protect you from the wiles of satan 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And God is faithful to forgive, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is always at work. So that frees us up to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God is working on the inside so we can work on the outside. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, a great promise, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And then after his words on God's gracious gift of sanctification, Paul then turns his attention to a few final comments on relationships. Paul first reminds them that prayer is the primary need for those engaged in ministry. You know what my, my greatest need is? It's, it's prayer. That you would pray for me. Our greatest need that we have and the way that we can bless each other the most is to pray one for another. Paul says there in, in verse 25, Brethren, brothers, pray for us. Now, Paul prayed for them three times in this letter. Now he asks for their prayers. Why? Because they are the ones who lead them in the sanctification process. And you know, notice the word brothers or brethren. Pray for us 15 times. 15 times in First and Second Thessalonians, we have brothers or sisters mentioned. Five times at the end of this letter. The church is pictured as a family. And Paul says the family needs to support each other, and the way you support each other is by praying for each other. The family prays for each other. And then second, Paul encourages the believers to show loving affirmation and affection for each other. Um, he says, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I don't necessarily recommend you do that today. But, uh, you know, a fist bump, a handshake, or whatever, a hug, something to let each other know, hey, I love you. I want to show some affection to you. I want you to know that you are loved. I mean, there's something about touching each other that, that gives each other strength and comfort like nothing else can. There's something about just a hug. Just something about a pat on the back. Yesterday, I was telling the Sunday school class, yesterday I had my first funeral that I had to do where we had to completely social distance. They did contact tracing, they, the, the, the whole works. In fact, I was in the chapel. I was standing by my cousin, who was my uncle's funeral, and there was some people outside that would not come into the room until I left. My cousin... I wanted so much to hug him. He had uh, lost his mom about a year ago. Now he lost his dad. And he lost his brother when he was uh, in his, I think, 40s. He was pretty young. So I was like, Tim, I know you're alone. I know what it's like to be alone. 
I lost my mom. She was 55 when she died. My mom and dad were divorced. I never really knew my dad. I didn't have any brothers and sisters. I just wanted to hug him and say, well, I, know, I know what it's like. I want to comfort you. I want to show you some affection. But you know what? I couldn't. I couldn't. Nobody wanted to be near each other. And I'm not used to that. We're, we're a loving church. You know, we, we hug and, and fellowship. And Paul says, I want you to greet one another with affection. Let them know they're not alone. Let them know that these struggles, these burdens they carry, they're meant for the church to carry with them, that you are not alone. And then finally, Paul uh, brought, sought to comfort the reading or to promote the reading of the scripture and the passing on of truth beyond their normal circles into other groups. And the Thessalonians were charged, adjured, as if bound under a covenant to read their letter to all the brethren. We have a great task ahead of us, and that is we need to let other people know the truth. Outside these walls, when we meet other people, when we meet other believers, the Church of Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility uh, to share the truth into their lives. And what's really interesting here is that at this point, you know, Paul had been dictating this letter, but at this point, Paul perhaps picked up the pen and wrote and finished the letter himself. Because he says, I charge you. And he makes this personal now. As Paul is saying, this is so important that I want to write this in my own hand. This is my own handwriting. And Paul does that in, in actually a number of his epistles. He does that in 2 Thessalonians. It's even clearer there. So Paul says this is important, that we get the truth out to everyone we possibly can. Now, I'm not saying that, that we have a whole handle on the truth or anything like that, but as I teach you, you teach me, we go out into the world, we, we teach other believers, they, they teach us, we strengthen each other that way. And then that brings us to the sanctification of really the place where we get it, and that is God's word, the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what? Thy word is truth. Share the word with each other. I, one of the things that I love the most is talking about the Bible. I would rather talk about the Bible than anything else. And just to sit down and share the word. You know what happens when you share the word with each other? You're sanctifying each other. You are building each other up. You are making each other more like Christ. And then Paul begins his letter by saying grace to you and peace. Now he ends it with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, it's easy to think of Paul's final line here as just kind of a throwaway, a, a, way, a means of signing off. But that view fails to consider that for Paul, grace that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ was everything. The word grace, I mean, we could, we could preach all day on, on grace. It's so multifaceted. But it includes the idea of favor, beauty, thanksgiving, delight, kindness, blessing, charm, and joy. For, for Paul, grace was always something undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor before God. And theologically speaking, grace is God's favor that is lovingly, lavishly, and eternally bestowed upon us by God the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the way Paul says uh, goodbye in this letter. This is the way he signs off. The question I want to ask you today since God is a God of peace, but that is only true for the believer. That is only true for the believer. Only the believer has peace. So the question to you today is, have you made your peace with God? Because if you haven't made peace with God, life will be a struggle. 
because God is trying to get you to the place where you do exactly that, that you make your peace with him. And then once you make your peace with God, then you can have peace in every situation in life. As you come to the one who has the great title, the Prince of Peace, the one who is able to give peace in all circumstances, even when it doesn't seem humanly possible, he can give that kind of peace. You know, studies have been done. They say the world looks for three things. They're looking for three things. They are looking for love. They are looking for happiness. And they are looking for peace. Do you know that those three things just happen to be the first of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, and peace. But in a world that is filled with chaos and darkness, this world needs to experience the true love of God. And the many, many are only going to experience it through us as we demonstrate that sacrificial love of God. The world is looking for happiness, but they're looking for it in all the wrong places. Only we can point them to true joy, which goes beyond the circumstances of life to an inner strength, an inner expression and then peace wow the world would love to have peace how many times do you hear see people say what do you want i want world peace well i'm gonna tell you that's an impossibility until the prince of peace sits on the throne everything else will find will just be an illusion but the world needs to hear the world needs to hear that there will, no, there will be no peace. The global reset will not bring peace. The one world government will not bring peace. When the Antichrist comes, it's going to be a false peace. The only peace, the only peace is for let, to let Jesus rule and reign. And that begins in your heart. Remember that old song, there's one way to peace through the power of of the cross and if you have not been to the cross and knelt at the cross and confessed your sins to God and repented of those sins and taken Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you have not done that you're not at peace with God today and I'm challenging you make peace with God you'll be so glad that you did could I have your heads bowed your eyes closed Is there anybody here, say, Pastor, would, would you pray for me? I, I have never made my peace with God. I, I've not, there's not been a time in my life when I've come to the cross. And I've said to God with a humble heart, I see that I have sinned. I have missed the mark so badly. But I confess that to you today, God. And I, and I repent of that. And, and I ask that you would help me and that you would change me. To begin, what you're praying for is the sanctification process. To be justified, first of all. To be so forgiven that God doesn't remember your sin at all anymore. But when he looks at you, he just sees the righteousness of Christ. But to just confess that before God and acknowledge that you need him to be your savior and then put your trust in him. Believing that he died for you and that his sacrifice on the cross paid for your sins. You're not trusting in any works of righteousness that, that you have done. You're not trusting in any goodness that you might have done. You are simply trusting in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And if you come to him that way and lay it all out, he will come and he will give you peace that you cannot even imagine. So is there anybody here today by a raised hand you'd say, Pastor, I need that peace. I need to confess my sins. I have not done this before, but I want to do it today. Is there anyone just by a raised hand up and then down? Okay, Christian, let me talk to you for a minute. 
How's that daily sanctification going? Are you, are you being separated from the world and set apart for God? Are you living for God? Or is God saying to you today, you know, there are some things in your life that are hindering you from becoming more like, more like me. And I want to I work there. I want to do a work in your life there. And would you submit to me and let me, let me work in your life? Let me make you more like Jesus. See, it's going to happen. You're going to become like Jesus. If you're a true believer, it's so much easier, let me tell you, it's so much easier to cooperate with God than fight against him. But if you would willingly surrender today, you can do that right where you're at. And as the Holy Spirit brings things to your mind, say, thank you, Lord, for pointing that area out to me. And you just can't purpose to do better, but you can say, God, as you give me the grace, together we will work and make me more like Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the work that you have done, that you have justified us. Thank you for the work that you are doing, that you are sanctifying us. And we look forward to the work that someday you will do when we stand glorified in your presence. Pray your blessing upon each one here today in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you could sit tight for a few minutes. Last week we took an offering for... Um, Paul I, and in particular the ministry of the orphanage in Cambodia, and they're going to show some pictures of that, um, so you can know where your money went last week and, and, and what you gave to. So I'm going to ask Dick to come up. He's going to soon introduce this.